Yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, I changed the title a bit to sound a bit more fancy. Um, so what I propose today is the use of uh, deep generative models in uh, neuroscience and in particular in brain computer interfaces because it's for me kind of a nice application uh, topic to actually work with. Um, so just very briefly, um, what I'm mainly interested in in the, uh, in the follow, uh, following work is the discrimination between uh, error-related potentials um, and that is quite useful in spelling devices um, and uh, other kinds of EG-based um, brain-computer interfaces. So um, in the past, of course, with the rise of deep learning, uh, more and more people um, applied actually um, deep nets as the discriminative model in uh, brain-computer interfaces. And the question I uh, asked myself um, over the uh, last month is if um, deep neural networks are actually the right tool to use in discriminative tasks uh, in neuroscience. So basically to replace classification algorithms. Um, and the answer I can give you at this moment is that I think that there are much more interesting fields to apply deep learning in neuroscience. Um, and that in classification we can as well stick to other methods. Um, if you look at the literature, there are um, right now a couple of um, proposed architectures out there and what you uh, recognize when people actually um, use deep neural networks in neuroscience applications is that the margin by which you can improve uh, classification scores or uh, other uh, sorts of accuracies um, is there, but it's not a considerable margin. If you um, remember the, uh, the last talk in imaging, for example, error rates when you uh, replace SVMs and classical methods by um, deep networks uh, drop from 25% to below human performance. This is not true in neuroscience and uh, I believe that uh, one, this is because the data sets are quite small we use, but even if we use big data sets because we have um, very noisy signals, um, actually you cannot really um, properly um, learn us uh, useful stuff from, uh, from this uh, sort of data. So um, even very shallow architectures um, perform almost on, on par with uh, deeper ones. Okay, so um, one particular problem um, that you have in neuroscience data and in particular in brain computer interfaces is domain shift. Um, domain shift is the property that uh, when you're training data set, um, if you say images could, like, uh, could look like this, um, you fit your classifier, you get a classification boundary and then you transfer the classifier to a test data set that um, is shifted in, in some way, so here's just the background actually, um, then this classification boundary no longer fits. And you have the same in brain-computer interfaces to a much greater extent. So you have this uh, between subjects, you also have this um, between uh, imaging domains, you have this um, between um, uh, Im um, recording sessions even for, for a single subject, and this really degrades the performance of, of brain-computer interfaces. And, uh, neuroscience uh, analyses uh, in general. So uh, the proposal here is to come up with a method that um, is able to, to adapt between different data domains uh, using deep neural networks and uh, generative processes. Um, and one nice, uh, uh, one nice proposal in, in the vision community over the last year um, was uh, developed in, in Tübingen by Leon Gattis and Matthias Wittke, uh, which is uh, artistic style transfer, which has the idea of taking a signal and then modifying the signal in a way that the content of the signal is actually preserved, so the image information, while the style of the image is altered. Um, and this is a very nice framework for this um, like showcase application of style transfer, but I believe also for domain adaptation. Because the idea is basically to re-render a signal as if it was recorded in another, um, um, in, in, in another data domain. So um, why not apply this to, uh, to EG signals, for example? and use this to uh, actually adapt uh, the, uh, the signals to, to different domains. Um, the idea is as follows, um, we have a deep net um, that kind of removes all the style and measurement information from the signal and then you have uh, a second pathway that integrates the style of, uh, of, of your second signal onto the signal and uh, then basically generates the signal as if it was uh, recorded um, in, in this different data domain. Um, and this is um, done in an adversarial fashion, so you um, basically have uh, these two networks play, uh, playing a game uh, against each other and the one network is trying to adapt uh, the signal and another network basically distinguishes, um, okay, is the data now recorded from subject one or subject two? And you kind of try to re-render the data to fool this uh, second network 
that's uh, the overall idea. Um, and because um, uh, EG data is, is kind of hard to visualize in this instance, here's a quick depiction um, of how, uh, what it actually does um, with, uh, with these endless digits. So the model was trained on this source data set and the uh, target data set is this one. So uh, where the color, for example, is flipped and you apply some class dependent noise. And the task of the model is actually to re-render this kind of data set as if it was this one uh, without having any class information from, uh, from this one. And with uh, regular networks, um, the performance basically drops to chance level. When you use this re-rendering procedure, you can actually first modify this data to appear as if it was actually recorded from the target domain and then you uh, are approximately on par with the previous performance. Um, and one other thing um, you can uh, talk to me um, about on the poster is really this generative process in the end that can also be used uh, for more general uh, tasks in uh, neuroscience applications and BCIs. This is for example an instance um, where you actually use this module to generate EEG data uh, for, for different stimuli, for example. And the idea is that you actually, instead of discriminating from signal to a label space, you go from the label space and then you generate the most likely signal, um, which is much richer in terms of the information you can pull uh, from the data set. Okay, um, with that I uh, want to conclude and um, the, the general claim is that when we apply deep learning in neuroscience applications, the real interesting thing is to use generative modeling um, instead of just uh, replacing classification algorithms. Thanks.